There we go. So hello everybody and welcome to this new session of the ABM for Policy seminar series. We have Kopier Georg uh, with us today from the University of Cape Town, also affiliated at the Deutsche Bundesbank. Um, you know, many of us know Cole from his works with systemic risk, financial networks, etc. But he's done very many things in the recent years, including blockchain technologies and, uh, well, of course, agent-based modeling works. Um, he'll be presenting today some work uh, regarding this spreading phenomena in networks, so very applicable with an application to uh, COVID-19 epidemic. So, Cole, floor is yours. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to present. It's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and, and fun to be here. Um, I just want to say in terms of the format, I can't see if somebody raises a hand or something like this just because the way the, the Zoom setup works. So if you have a question, uh, just interrupt me. Um, I think that's the new normal during Zoom anyways, but just come straight in and, and uh, we are really keen to get your feedback um, on this paper. And just the, the, the backstory of this, this is joint work with Alan Davids, Leon Duran, Tina Cozio, and Yuri Scasford. Uh, I think at least Alan is on the call as well. Um, and the, the backdrop to this paper actually is the work that we've done in financial interconnectedness. And when the global financial crisis hit in 2008, what happened was that a lot of physicists and complex systems people they flocked to finance and they pointed out a couple of things that the economists just had overlooked in, in their modeling, um, including the, the, the complex effects of interactions, the role of, of heterogeneous agents, um, the role of more complex behavioral rules. And there, there was a lot of literature showing that these things really matter, leading to most central banks nowadays running some form of systemic stress test, which is not, you know, agent based in the traditional sense, but uh, I would sort of, I would always look at this as an agent-based kind of model. There's also, I think, a bigger acceptance of agent-based modeling in the macro community, but really in the in the housing uh, housing modeling and in the financial interconnectedness modeling, a ABM has become uh, has become completely accepted, and there's there's really been great progress. So when when COVID hit, I thought this is our time to strike back because in many of the um, biological models, there was no role for explicit strategic behavior or agent behavior in the sense that it's not very, very mechanical. A lot of the, the COVID-19 um, epidemiological models were old style SIR kind of models that had no role for, for real agent behavior. And I figured, okay, now it's, it's payback time and the economists can show the biologists and all those guys um, how it is when a different field invades your, your turf. So we wanted to contribute to that. Um, and we, we wanted to build a model that takes some of the things that, that we've learned from the financial crisis um, about contagion processes and bring it back to, to epidemiological modeling. Oh, sorry. So let me just motivate why, um, why I think it's important that we, that we have a um, plurality of thoughts around our COVID models. The big question is how much can we rely on these? on these models. And when you look at South Africa, um, just as the backdrop, COVID really devastated our economy. We had a 51% year on year drop in GDP, which is mostly due to one of the world's most stringent lockdowns. Uh, we had a five week stay at home order with the army patrolling on the streets and forcing the lockdown. It was really much stricter than anything that I think has happened in Europe or in the US. Um, and it, it really locked the country down and it, it will take a long time for us to recover from this. The big question then is, was this really necessary? And initially, when you look at the, the first estimates that came out from the Ministry of Health, uh, they, they vastly overestimated the death toll from COVID-19 in South Africa. Um, the question is why? why? Why did these initial COVID models get it so wrong? Um, and one of the criticisms that has been leveled against these models is that they don't take endogenous behavior explicitly into account. So it could be that once you start um, allowing agents to anticipate that they might be exposed to a deadly disease, that they actually will adjust their behavior, they will stay home more, and therefore the disease will not spread as fast. Um, and therefore, as soon as you start taking this behavior into account, you know, maybe these original estimates would have to be revised quite significantly. And there's sort of a criticism um, of these official models that is 
that, that they've taken to heart. Um, and we have contributed a little bit within the country um, by, uh, by building the model, making it open source. So everything is, is on GitHub, um, including all the reproduction files. I think we were the first modeling group in South Africa to actually do this. So on a, on a post-mortem in a way, what the, what the official COVID-19 modeling consortium um, uh, concluded was that there are instances, however, where the development of the pandemic has taken us by surprise. Thankfully, although unexpectedly, confirmed COVID-19 deaths in the Western Cape, which is the, the region where Cape Town is in, have plateaued for the last four weeks and hospital admissions for COVID-19 in the Western Cape appear to have peaked on 22 June. Uh, that was last year. While the decline in admissions and plateau in mortality are welcome, the explanations remain unclear. Did we overestimate COVID-19 deaths in the Western Cape? So that was sort of the analysis already coming out last year. And what these um, traditional epidemiological models do is they try to bring everything down to the reproductive number or not. And what they do is they re-estimate their models a lot, sometimes daily to account for changes in this R0. And then they run the model forward, assuming that the recalibration, the new parameters stay fixed for the foreseeable future. But because you have to re-estimate so often, you actually know already that the parameter estimates that you use to, to calibrate your model will probably not be valid for a very long time. So one of the particular problems that these models had is that they weren't able to do longer term predictions into the future, specifically when it comes to second, and nowadays we are now a third wave, unfortunately. Um, so about, the, about these second and third waves, um, these, these traditional models can't do that. And it takes a lot of manual fiddling to actually get this right. So the, the, the question then is, um, can we use social learning to explain this overestimation of, of deaths? And um, can we include it in a model to get an endogenous, um, behavior change that, uh, that drives infections in a way that is more consistent with uh, observed data. And therefore, can we maybe reduce the number of parameters that we have in these models and the, the demand for re-estimating them? So the contribution that the model makes is that um, we add explicitly this, um, this, this social learning, which um, is different from I know there are some models, some COVID-19 models that, that have a notion of a very aggregate um, kind of learning where it's not individual agents uh, changing their behavior, but where sort of you assume behavior change for the population and it's really mechanistic in, in essence. Um, there's considerable empirical evidence, some coming out of the, the economics literature um, for the importance of social learning in the in the pandemic. And I'm just citing two papers here. There's many more that show that actually social learning has played a role um, in explaining how agents, how, how people behaved during the pandemic. What we do is we build um, a, a bottom-up social agent-based COVID-19 model, SUBCOM, um, which we calibrate to Cape Town's first wave. We validate it with uh, the number of excess deaths. So the, the number of excess deaths over time is the excess death curve, which is the most reliable estimate, um, especially in South Africa. But I think also globally, excess deaths are much better predictor than the number of infections, for example. Uh, the big downside to excess deaths is that you can only observe them with a two to four week delay. And um, you need to infer them after complicated statistical data cleaning that the Medical Association in South Africa is, is doing. And then we use this model and study uh, vaccination strategies, which is the most pressing question um, at the moment, just as a policy application to show the versatility of the, of the agent-based modeling approach. Our model has 100,000 heterogeneous agents. They are distributed over 116 so-called wards. A ward is an administrative unit, so it's like a suburb, basically. Um, uh, I think wards are, are based on elections, sort of where, like, um, this is the municipal electoral level, basically the lowest, um, the lowest level where you have the highest granularity. So you have 116 of these uh, units that make up the entirety of Cape Town. In each of these units, we, we um, locate households uh, where the size of the household is uh, calibrated from the census or so from official census data. Um, and the composition 
um, of the households comes from a contact matrix. I'll talk more about this contact matrix where we get it um, uh, as we go along, as I, as I talk you through the, the data details a little bit more for the calibration. But basically there's a, there's a, um, a national survey, which is ward level travel from the household travel survey, which tells you how agents travel between households. It would, would have been nice to get data from Google, for example, about mobility, um, but we, we couldn't get access to that, to that data. So this is the only available data, but it, it covers the ward to ward level travel. Uh, our model has like the, the standard SER, SI, SEIR models. We have different compartments and a compartment is a different state of the agent. Um, I'll, I'll talk you through them as well. We have an SEIIRCD model. So we have seven compartments um, that uh, capture the different progression of, of the disease. And then we, has, we have the virus transmission via the social network, which happens within households because you are exposed to the people in your household, but also from travel between different um, wards and from meeting households inside your ward that are outside of your, your household. So you meet other agents that are not in your household, but that are in your ward. And whenever you have a meeting because of work or because um, you have to go to the hospital or wh whatever the reason is for all these physical meetings, you then have the risk of COVID transmission via this network. So one of the advantages of this model is that you can predict infections on the ward level which helps cities planning um, their emergency responses. Um, we can't really calibrate down to the ward level, unfortunately, because um, Cape Town doesn't produce ward level excess fatality information. But if you have a city um, in, in Europe where the data quality is a little better and you have that kind of granular excess death data, then you could even calibrate this on a ward by ward basis. So our calibration is based on Cape Town as a whole um, and then we can still show how the aggregate um, curves that we, that we predict from the data um, actually would break down into different, uh, different of these wards um, for, for Cape Town. The contact network has different states. So you have each node is an agent, each link is a social connection, a physical connection. And then you have some agents who are asymptomatic, some, some agents who are exposed, so asymptomatic means you are infected, but you are not, you don't show any symptoms. Some agents are exposed, some are susceptible to, um, to receiving um, uh, the disease, but who aren't exposed. And then some agents are exposed and uh, are um, infected and symptomatic. And each of these networks is a ward. So you see the connection within the ward, depending on household size and things like that. And then because of travel, you have these dotted lines, which indicate whenever one agent travels to another ward to meet an agent in that other ward. So the, the dotted lines are these um, travel connections. And this is just a stylized representation for two wards. And we do this for all the 116 wards where we have the ward to ward uh, travel probability. We can talk a little bit more about how we get from this travel survey to, uh, to the actual, um, network of interconnectedness and it, it, it involves a little bit of an estimation which is similar in spirit to the maximum entropy methods that you had for financial network extrapolation. So there will be some limitations to this, um, but it's also just a simple parameter um, or set of parameters that you can change in the model if ever you have sort of the more granular Google mobility data, for example, which does exist. Um, it's just that, that it's very sensitive and we couldn't get access to it. So the, the model we have is an agent-based model that, that boils and, and the way to, for me to, to explain it is to, to talk about the update algorithm. Um, it starts with a set of initial infections, which we calibrate based on empirical data for each day until the end of our calibration from where onwards, then we can do a prediction. Uh, we then run over a day loop for the simulation. So for all days in the simulation, we, we do these following four steps. We check the status of the health system. So we have explicitly taken into account that hospitals can get overwhelmed because it was a big concern initially. In Cape Town, luckily, we never really had 
overwhelmed hospitals or not for a long time at least, um, which is great. Um, but in other countries, I think especially in Italy, you, you're seeing in the beginning, our hospitals were just completely overwhelmed and this had um, knock-on effects where the, where the probability to die if you were infected and symptomatic would just increase. So we have this multiplier explicitly taken into account if the health system gets overwhelmed. Um, we then check the compliance and compliance means compliance with non-pharmaceutical interventions as recommended by the government. So these can be stay at home orders, it can be mask wearing, it can be hand washing. So all of these kind of things are combined into uh, a compliance with official guidelines which then uh, affects the probability of disease transmission when two agents meet. Once the agents meet, then there's an update of the infection status. And we then, in, at the end of each loop, compute the new infections. We do this for the duration of the simulation. And when the day loop is, is finished, we store all the data. So we record the observables on each day. We store the data and the, the program ends. I'll walk you through these four steps. Um, just now, unless there are any questions um, at this point that you want me to address before we go into more details of the of the update algorithm. All right, uh, that's not the case, and let me just. But Adrian, you, you guys can still hear me. I'm still there. Yes, yes, everything is fine. Okay, <laughs> very good. Yeah, that's only the 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 main downside of Zoom is that you can't see uh, the audience's faces as you go along. And presenting is a lot like comedy and it all depends on timing and it's a bit more tricky on Zoom. So um, let me just tell you the different steps in the update algorithm and then I talk you through, through our results. As I said, there's this health system capacity check where you check for each day whether the number of critically ill patients is higher than the capacity of the, of the hospitals that you have and if, if it is, so if the L is the capacity. So if you have more critically uh, ill patients, then you, you change the, um, the probability to, uh, to die and increase it um, by this multiplier. And it's a little more, the delta L is a little more complicated than the probability to die, but it's a multiplicative factor that affects the probability to die. Um, then in the second step, we update the compliance. And this is really a key part of our model. So I'll spend a little bit of time on this slide. Uh, we use a very naive social learning, following the fruit um, in, in, the 19, in this 1974 um, work. And we used uh, the specification of Dazaraka et al. in their uh, really nice uh, paper on learning about the changing state, um, where the idea is that you have an agent's compliance with reducing contact. So it's a, the order is you, you have to reduce physical contact, you have to engage in physical distancing. And the question is how much does the agent comply with that? Um, so you want to, this is normalized between zero and one, and we want to find out how much does an agent comply. And there are two parts to that. There's a private signal consisting of a government signal, as well as an individual noise term. And there is a part, so there's a weight rho for this. And then there is a, with weight one minus rho, there's a part which is just the average over the neighbor's compliance. So the, the, the thing that, that is a little tricky here is that this is an average over compliance, while this is um, a government signal uh, together with a noise term. So, but what we are, what we are assuming here is that the, um, um, the government signal basically the, the publicly available information that the government is sending to everybody, takes into account everyone's compliance, the current state of hospital admissions, you know, all the information that the public health system has that individual agents might not have. But it's really the information, the public signal is a signal around um, the progression of the disease um, independent of the agent's social neighborhood. So it doesn't matter where you are in the network. This is the, you know, the state of the, of the disease in Cape Town. It's just this public signal. And then there's an individual noise term, which is just to, to, to account for agents sort of perceptiveness to the government signal. Some agents, when they, see, when they see a government signal that says you need to be very compliant, they sort of overreact and they are particularly uh, compliant. Now, Germans usually uh, are like that. 
um, any excuse to, uh, to to be compliant happily appreciated um, some agents are less compliant and this is taken into account into this noise term um, around the public signal. The, the thing where, where we're keen on feedback, um, maybe even at the end if, if, uh, if you guys have thoughts on that, is that this term really is a little different from the traditional way to do this where uh, you observe the excess deaths. Right? This is the, the, the action, the compliance of neighbors, which is driven by how many excess deaths you have, and then by some micro-founded behavior for each agent, which we don't explicitly include in, in our model, because if you were to use a quadratic utility function, you can show that the, the actions that, that an agent take, they just boil down to whether or not you have more or less than half, uh, like one half uh, of this weighted signal. So you can, you can cut the utility part out a little bit, and you can just focus on what you're what the mixture of your public and your social signal is. And if the signal is high, you will be compliant. And if it's low, you will not be compliant. That's the idea here. Um, but it is a little different from agents being able to observe the number of um, infections or excess deaths right away. And it, it, it really comes from that um, empirical fact that excess deaths as sort of a reliable means of seeing where the disease is or how far the disease has progressed, that this is only available with a few weeks delay. Um, so this is the, the, the social learning that we are using. Um, I said the, the simplest possible form. Um, we assume that the sym symptomatic infections, hospitalizations, and the deaths of neighbors influence agent compliance. So when you see your neighbors uh, dying or uh, being uh, hospitalized or having symptomatic infections, this is, this is what goes into the 5K and drives your own compliance. So this means that an, a neighbor J has to observe belief of BJ equals one, uh, BJ times T minus one, uh, of T minus one equals one if she's symptomatic in critical condition or has died as a consequence of COVID. Meaning if you are, if you are symptomatic in critical condition or dead, then you're fully compliant. And that's how we uh, construct the individual, um, individual signal from the social and the public signal. So in the next step, then, there is the updating of the infection status. And as I said, we have these seven compartments where you start from a susceptible compartment, where you go to an exposed compartment, where you are exposed to possibly um, being infected with the disease. And after tau e days, you either become symptomatic or asymptomatic. And if you are asymptomatic, there is an infection probability that you actually develop the, the disease. Um, there's a transition of uh, after tau AS days, you, you are recovered once you have developed the, the disease. Um, but you can be asymptomatic, not develop the disease, and then you are susceptible again. And the same goes for symptomatic. Um, if you are symptomatic and you develop the disease, then after tau S days, you either go into critical condition or you recover. Um, and if you are into if you're in critical condition, then there's an additional transition after tau C days where you can die. And this is where the hospital multiplier comes in, or where again you will be recovered. So this is uh, in line with what the, the the most sophisticated, I think, COVID-19 models um, that are globally used are, are doing, where you have these uh, seven compartments. Um, and the key parameters here really are, are the infection probabilities. So a lot of the other parameters you can easily calibrate based on the literature, but these, in, these infection probabilities, that's something that needs to be calibrated based on the underlying data that you have. So and then we, in the fourth step, we compute new infections. So we start with an interaction. We look at the status of an agent um, and their neighbors, if the neighbor is susceptible and an agent is either symptomatic or asymptomatic, um, then we check whether the neighbor is in the household of the infected agent, if, if she is. Then there is a check with the transmission probability. And if you are unlucky, then, um, then you are exposed. And when you are exposed, then you have a probability of developing the disease. But this is, this is sort of the, the progression 
through the compartments. It's not something that the interaction between agents is driving anymore. That's purely the disease driving this. Um, and if you are if you're not exposed, then you just go back to this to this random likelihood to meet, and this is sort of where um, where things can can end up, and then um, so sort of agents don't meet, and the the progression, uh, so the, iter the iteration over all the agents just proceeds, and this is how you loop over all the agents. The likelihood to meet is a factor, is a is a function of the compliance. Um, as well as the neighbor's compliance. And this is how you then compute new infections and at the end of each step, you just update the total number of infections. All right, any questions on the algorithm so far? It's actually not that complicated. You just have to separate where agents travel with how the disease progresses. So you, you, you have the traveling and meeting agents meet each other the decision making of agents, which takes into account um, the state of the disease transmission in Cape Town globally, as well as the uh, number of infections in the agent's neighborhood. And from there on, uh, you decide whether you, you will travel, whether you will meet with other households, and then you can become exposed and then infected. And then it goes through the different compartments, just how the disease would progress in, in a stochastic fashion. So the challenge with with these models is always how do you how do you use them for prediction? So you need to calibrate a lot, and I think it's it's, it's the most common criticism of agent-based models is that you need a lot of parameters to to calibrate. Um, on the other hand, I would argue that it's not that bad, and that the parameters that we need we can actually find good estimates, and that leaves us with the need to calibrate based on observed data, a handful of uncertain parameters. So we use COVID-19 pathogen parameters, city data, and then we are left with the four initial uncertain parameters that we need to, uh, to estimate based on the excess fatality curve. And those are the weight of the private signal, the rho. That's not something that we, that we can observe. The size of the private noise component, again, not something that is observable to the econometr uh, econometrician the transmission probability of the virus, that is something that I think in theory you, you could calibrate if you had much more detailed information about um, virus transmission between different groups of, of people. But at the moment, the medical literature, I don't think is quite there yet. And then the number of initial infections is actually surprisingly hard to calibrate empirically. For a city like Cape Town, we did not have good number of infections for the early days of the disease, which if you don't have your initial conditions right, you know, um, it's very difficult to do any, any form of decent forecasting. So these are the four parameters that we, that we need to estimate. In terms of the pathogen parameters that we are using, we follow, and, and I'm not gonna go through, through them in, in any sort of detail. We just follow the, the extant literature to find all the, like the latency period, the recovery period for asymptomatic, symptomatic infections, the days that an agent is critical on average, the probability to become asymptomatic, um, the probability to become critically ill, and then the probability to die, which we actually do age dependent, as well as the probability to, be, to become critically ill to account for the fact that this really mostly affects um, elderly and uh, people with comorbidities. And then um, because it has shown to be important, we also include the, the health system overburden multiplier, but for that you also find empirical literature. So this is something we can put in. Um, we can then uh, include these age uh, specific probabilities to enter critical or the deceased state based on, um, on the literature. And this is from Verity et al, as well as the National Institute of Communicable Diseases, which is the South African organization that deals with COVID from a medical perspective mostly. Um, we then also use City of Cape Town data, mainly the national census, as well as the, uh, the travel survey, but also data from a paper by Prem, Cook and Jit um, about the stringency of um, the lockdown. So we have the age distribution and population per ward, the household size and distribution per ward, the contact matrix um, within a household, which is the composition per household, where we assume that if you are in the same household, you can't isolate from people living in the same household. 
um, the non-household contact matrix, um, the, which is sort of the, 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 the number of contacts you have with people outside of your household, um, the travel matrix uh, to, to capture how you travel across wards, the number of initial cases per ward, and then the stringency index to capture the stringency of, of the lockdown. Cool. The, yeah? the non-household contact matrix, is that within the ward or is that a general one? This is the, yeah, so you, you start by constructing it. So it's a, com, it's a slightly more complex sort of process to, to construct it, but you start from within the ward and then you, you, you go out to beyond the ward. Okay. Alan, do you, do you want to add something on this? Yeah, yeah. So, so for the most part, we essentially know the, the total number of household contacts. Obviously, that remains in the ward. We then also know from the travel matrix the probability that someone travels from their ward to any other ward on a particular day. And then we simply just assign the non-household uh, contact matrix with respect to the, prob the probability that the person stays in their ward uh, or the probability that they travel to, to any other ward. Okay, thanks, thanks. Cool, thanks. Um, all right, and then we need to, we, we need to estimate the, the unknown parameters. Oh, and, and Adrian, just from, from my understanding, we have an hour in total, correct? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay, awesome, then I don't need to rush too much. All right, um, so for the estimation procedure, what we do is we start pick bounds for the uncertain parameters. These are very generous, but not completely unrealistic bounds. Um, for the weight of the private signal between 0.05 and 0.7, for the size of the private noise component uh, between 0.1% and 10%, uh, the transmission probability of the virus within a reasonable bound, where the reasonable bound is just based on how many, so like estimating this takes a lot of time, even on a cluster. Um, so we, we put in some bounds where we have reasonable run times for this and that are well above any parameters that we could find in the, in the literature to make sure that we don't have a boundary solution. Um, as well as the initial infections, somewhere between 1,000 and 3,500. This, this is quite high, but that's sort of based on the fact that, especially initially, we just didn't have tests um, in, in South Africa. It took a while for us to, to build up the testing capacity to actually even detect these initial infections. And we were quite late relative to other countries. So you have a lot of uncertainty here. Um, but if you go beyond a thousand initial infections early on in the disease, then you, you will never get the, the total number that is sort of anywhere close to realistic. We then use the Latin hypercube sampling to select five initial parameter sets. And for each combination, we minimize um, this, this needle malfunction uh, to fit the excess fatality curve um, using this uh, another meat simplex um, algorithm to, to find the optimal um, most likely parameter estimates. And that's what we then use for our, um, for our calibration. We, we do a little bit of manual fine tuning after everything is said and done, um, just because even with, with this another meat simplex algorithm, you still end up with a fairly coarse calibration. And if you play around with it just a little bit manually, you can actually improve it even, um, even a little bit. So that's why we then do this uh, manual fine tuning afterwards. But it's always around the bounds of what we find um, from the simulation. All right, so that gives us values for the for the for the private signal for the uh, so for the weight of the of the uh, of the public signal for the private signal noise, as well as initial infections and uh, the disease um, um, transmission probability. All right, so far so good. So let me show you a couple of results. The first one is that if we use social learning, it actually improves our model fit. So what you see here is the empirical number of excess deaths, that is the, the black curve, as well as the simulated deaths. Um, and if you compare that uh, without uh, without social learning, then the root mean square error is 19.34. And if you include social learning, you can show that you actually quite uh, improve quite a lot so that you have a root mean square error of 11.4. And the key difference really comes from 
the fact that social learning can change the shape of the curve to a curve that has a higher peak, but not a substantially broader width of the peak. And if you, if you change the R0 um, in a normal SIR model, in a, in a sort of differential equation-based SIR model, what you end up with is a very different form of, of changes. As soon as you change R0, you can change the, the, when the peak happens and the width of the peak and the height of the peak, but they are related in a way that is fairly incompatible with empirical observations. So it's very difficult for these models to get with the same initial parameter calibration to fit the entire curve that you, and this is the black curve, the entire curve that you empirically observe and because of that, these models very often re-estimate R0 as they go along through the curve in order to be able to produce this empirical number as well as possible. But this re-estimation, I, I, I really genuinely don't like it because you reduce your, your forecasting ability uh, with this. So what we show is if you include, um, it's an additional parameter in the model, but a parameter that is sort of in a fairly well-developed economic you know, modeling framework um, that has been tried and tested, and you, you add this to the model, you can actually, without re-estimating, um, include the model fit quite a lot. So that's the first result. Uh, you, you, social learning improves the model fit. The second re uh, result is that the social learning reduces the curve height and the time to peak. And that really speaks to this, um, these three parameters that I, that I said initially are difficult to get right at the same time. So to, to get the curve height, the time until the peak, as well as the width of the curve to make that match empirical observations, um, that is quite difficult. And when you include social learning, you can reduce the curve height and the time to peak, which in a normal SAR model you can't do at the same time. So it's qualitatively a different outcome that is more consistent with the observed empirical data. So here we have this um, for 50 simulations with average, um, uh, average of infection, fatality, and compliance curves um, as a function of a changing weight of the private signal. So here on the x-axis we change, uh, oh sorry, on, the, on the, the different colors correspond to different, pri uh, different weights of the private signal. And then you can see how um, if you don't have any social learning, this, this is the curve that would obtain. But as you add sort of more and more social learning, the standard thing happens that, that you always have in these models, there's sort of this tipping point behavior where until a certain value of that parameter, not a lot happens. Then in the vicinity of this critical parameter, a lot happens. And I'm not talking, I'm not using criticality in the statistical physics kind of sense here. Um, so, but a lot of, uh, around that, uh, around that tipping point value, a lot of uh, a small change in the parameter has a lot of effect and then far away from it even a big change has little effect but that's quite common in in these kind of models and it's a lesson that uh, in the global financial crisis um, so many people had learned in a variety of models and that the um, um, COVID-19 modelers haven't really sort of internalized fully so that's one of the contributions that you can that you can get this um, reduced curve height and reduced time to peak at the same time by adding social learning. So if, if you were just to decrease the contacts um, while keeping social learning constant, that is what these models, the SIR models do. You can the curve height, you can uh, reduce the curve height. So if you uh, reduce contacts from, oh, sorry, if you reduce contacts from this brown line to the green, uh, let's do the, to the orange line down here, to the orange line. So from 0.56 to 0.31, you can actually sort of flatten the curve, but when you flatten the curve, the time to peak always gets pushed out. Mechanically, that's just how it has to happen um, in, these, in these models, just because that's how the percolation process works. Um, but that's not consistent with what we have observed, in particular, not in Cape Town. And the consequence was that people thought, oh, the peak will happen only you know, weeks from now while we actually already had the peak and then these lockdown effects stay in place much longer, uh, the lockdown policies stay in place much longer than they would have had to if you had done the proper estimation of this model. And that's another contribution of, of our paper. 
So in, in, in our model, social learning in a, in a lockdown, so with the government intervening, reduces fatalities and pushes back the, the peak infections um, so that they happen further in the future. And it really speaks to the question of, okay, so you're telling us that the lockdown was probably too long and probably too harsh based on the inf available information that, that people had in the beginning where they overestimated the fatalities. And once you allow for endogenous agent behavior, all of this gets pushed out. But then is the lockdown actually effective? And we show that even with social learning, the lockdown was very effective in order to, to curb the spread of the virus, reduce the total infections, uh, total number of deaths. Um, so that's, that's something that still stays, but it's really a matter of uh, what is the optimal policy based on the, on, on the model. And, and it's not what you would have thought based on the traditional SIR models. Um, the same effects um, hold in the no intervention scenario. So if there wasn't a lockdown, you can also still see the effect of, um, of social learning. So this is, I think this is the no learning. Yeah, the no learning scenario. Um, so you see that there's a, a reduction um, in the number of fatalities. And when you compare this with the, with the lockdown scenario, you see how the lockdown prevented 50%, uh, 60% of deaths. So it's, it's still quite effective, but you know when exactly that lockdown should have happened, that is different um, based on our model than what you would have, um, what you would have uh, seen in the standard SAR model. And that's just sort of the visual representation of the lockdown and the no intervention and sort of how it, how social learning would affect those. Um, uh, the, the vertical line indicates the date of the peak infections here. And you can see how the, um, the number of deaths here really, how that makes a big difference, whether or not you have a lockdown or no, no intervention. And the difference here, that is really how many lives have been saved by the lockdown. So the policy remains effective. It's just a matter of when you would uh, want to enact this, enact this, and then this is just a um, um, a table showing this in in, in numbers rather than figure. Uh, so now that we have this model and we've calibrated it to Cape Town, and we we've shown that the um, the social learning actually helps to uh, have a better prediction of how the disease would spread um, across Cape Town. Let's look at some more sort of recent policy discussions, and the the one that people are uh, busy with in South Africa because we haven't really started vaccinating. I mean, we have some, but it's um, it's it's really just starting. Uh, it will take a long time, probably into next year easily before we have sort of 60, 70% vaccinated. The question is, how do you do vaccinations? And then some people have suggested, well, that's the standard suggestion is you, you do the, the elderly first. But some people have suggested to actually look at most connected age groups with the idea being uh, actually this goes back to a lot of the attack and defense and networks literature where you where you can show that if you defend the center of a star it's the most effective way to protect the leaves in that um, in that star um, so why not uh, vaccinate the most connected age groups first um, the challenge here is that you actually need to find out who are the most connected people. And what we have here is we have used data from this connectivity matrix, which is um, based on the survey, to know sort of which age groups are uh, sort of most connected with one another. And then we start vaccinating those first. And we compare this, um, and let, let's, yeah, let's look at, yeah, let's look at critical cases because it's uh, the easiest to, to see. We compare this, um, the number of uh, critical cases for a connection-based strategy with a random vaccination strategy where you just say, look, you just rock up to the, to the vaccination center, you get vaccinated, no checks, no nothing, just randomly we vaccinate people. Um, and you can see that this is even less effective than, than the random vaccination, um, while the most effective vaccination strategy is this risk-based based on the elderly and those with comorbidities. So even if you take into account explicitly the network structure, um, unless, I, and that's something that we haven't done, but maybe we could do is to look into how much information would we need about individual agents. So if we, if we knew everybody's exact degree and we vaccinate those with the highest degree first, as opposed to the connected age groups, 
maybe that would have a bigger effect. So to find the super spreaders and vaccinate those rather than just, you know, the group in which the super spreaders is, maybe this would be more effective. Um, but it's definitely not the case where you can find an easy proxy to um, sort of to, to, to find somebody's connectivity status and then just vaccinate based on that. So, sorry, Ko, one question about hmm? these figures. Um, are you vaccinating everybody at the beginning of the simulation? Or are you imposing a certain oh. vaccination strategy or? Oh yeah, my apologies. I guess you're vaccinating through time. Or yes, exactly. Like that, right? So this is a, thank you very much uh, for, for the question. Um, we vaccinate a fixed number of people per time. I think it's 200 out of 100,000, which is based on the government's plan for a vaccination strategy in South Africa. And I say the government's plan because it has been delayed a couple of times so we are significantly behind um, this 200 uh, per day in Cape Town. But that's, I think, I, I don't remember the exact number, I think it was 200 per day that, that would be vaccinated or something like that. It's a constant stream of vaccinations per day. What you also see, and what I, what I thought was super interesting is that even if you, if you vaccinate a small part of the population between one May and one August, that's like three months, that's 100 days, so that's uh, 200,000, uh, 20,000 out of the 4 million inhabitants for Cape Town. Now that's a very small number, but you still reduce uh, the critical cases significantly if you, if you just vaccinate the elderly first. That's because they are far more likely to, to become infected. So that's just to wrap up and maybe leave a couple of minutes for questions. So that's what we did in the paper. We studied the, the effects of the social learning in a, in a network model of COVID-19, a bottom-up model, agent-based model. Uh, we then add social learning um, because we did not like the constant recalibration because they would reduce the ability to, to forecast using this model. We show that the social learning helps to improve our fit um, for the access fatality curve for Cape Town. It both flattens and shortens the curve for infections and fatalities, which is in contrast to uh, reducing the, the contacts or the transmission probabilities uh, in a standard SEIR model, which would always flatten and lengthen these curves, which is inconsistent with what we have observed empirically. Actually, I would say, uh, without looking, having looked in too deep into the European data, but I think the same will be true for Europe, where the the length to the peak has been significantly overestimated by these uh, standard SEIR models. Um, however, learning alone is also not sufficient to curb the spread of the virus because the, the social learning, as we have modeled it here, is much slower than the disease spreads. And this really is an interesting um, finding, I think, because there's a little bit of literature on competing contagions and a little bit of a, of a literature on um, sort of different forms of learning on the network, but not a lot. And here we have a very practical example where the speed of learning is slower than the speed of the contagion process over which agents are learning. And that's not something that we had during the financial crisis, really. Um, but I think it's an interesting avenue to explore because agent-based models are particularly well suited to explicitly model this and study this. Um, and then the normal analytical models will not be able to make a lot of headway because you have all these feedback effects between the spread of the virus and the spread of learning about the virus. Um, and I think this, this effect will be present in a lot of systems where it hasn't been studied. So that's, I, I think, something that, that is interesting for, for this particular community to study a little bit more because it's something that normal models and analytical models just can't do. Um, then we just for the policy part, we do show that the vaccination strategy, the risk-based vaccination strategy, leads to a big reduction in fatalities um, at a cost of only a minor increase in total infections. And with that, uh, I'm at an end, and I'm looking forward to to any comments, any thoughts um, you might have. Questions. Cool. I see two hands at least. Oh, am I? Yeah. Oh yes. Uh, okay. 
Uh, Mattia, do you want to start asking? Hey, yes. Well, first of all, thanks a lot uh, for the nice presentation. It was a uh, really a pleasure. I should go deeper into your model because I think it's really interesting. And I have, uh, well, one point and one question. The point is about your uh, very last graph with the uh, COVID vaccination and you had the strategy of whether target uh, elderly people or whether to target the, uh, the key spreaders. And uh, it would be interesting to show also another statistics which relates to the uh, life expectancy variation. Uh, I don't know if, uh, you're, if you have the age in your model. Uh, I mean, how, how detailed you are with the age in your model, but uh, in a way, uh, it might be that, yes, you have uh, way more debt when you have the connection based, but you might uh, have a lower, oh, I see. A lower reduction uh -huh. in the life expectancy. And uh, depending on the, on the politicians, I mean, this is not an economist's choice to make. Uh, the decision might be, okay, let's uh, target the elderly first or let's target the, the, the most connection-based because I mean, most connection-based can, be, uh, can be younger people. I see, that's a very good point. Um, we haven't looked at this. Um, we, haven't, we haven't dared thinking uh, about it in, in the way that you just proposed, but it's, it, we can. Because the life expectancy, we know, we know that um, for Cape Town, even for different groups in Cape Town, so we, we know that. And it could be that if you do life expectancy, that this picture changes a little bit. I don't think so, though. And the reason I'm saying that is that um, the mortality rate for young people is really quite low. And Cape Town has an average exceptionally young population. I think the average age in Cape Town is 27 or so while in, in Europe, it's, it's well over 50, you know. Yeah. There's, that, that's there's, why in Europe, in, in Europe, we had this debate uh, also for, for this reason, actually. Mm. Yeah, but that's, that's very interesting. So we, we, we should look into this. Um, yeah, that's, that point is well taken. Well, it's a good idea. Other, and the other small question is, uh, is actually related. I wonder whether uh, when you vaccinate uh, in, in your policy, uh, you also uh, condition the vaccination upon the fact of not being infected before because i mean infected people they uh, might have already antibi antibi yeah. uh, antibodies and therefore you might not want to vaccinate them for the moment and maybe uh, postpone the vaccination of these people yeah that's also a good question we we don't assume that you can test who had it already which unfortunately is pretty much in line what what is the reality on the ground in south africa we've been begging uh, the health department to do representative test testing just across time, so we know how many people had it. Estimates are that 50% to 60% of the population in Cape Town by today already had COVID, but nobody knows for sure. And you, we also don't know how the variants affect sort of reinfections. These are things that you can add to a model like this, but the, the medical science isn't there yet, and the testing isn't there, unfortunately. Okay, thanks a lot. I don't know who was next. Um, I think uh, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, but very fascinating presentation. Um, so my question was about kind of different um, COVID variants. Um, hmm. So some of them have like, you know, much higher um, infection or the potential to infect people than, than others. So is that, is that something you can reflect either, you know, just by, I mean, of course you can probably change a parameter value, right? But, but is there like, an element where you can um, model the different strands, how they compete with, with each other, and then one takes over from the other, uh, kind of being the majority of, of the reflections. Um, thanks. Yeah, th yeah, that's also a good question. We can do it in the model. We haven't done it, though. And the reason why we haven't done it is because it's not a modeling challenge, it's a calibration challenge. And it all boils down to the testing. Um, if we had the data on sort of different variants and how prevalent they are then we could easily calibrate this but for Cape Town, there's no hope of of getting this data so maybe yeah we've thought about it because it's i, I really like this literature on competing contagions uh, i think there's a lot of contributions still to be made even going back to the financial um contagion literature there's interesting papers that can be written on this um, and it's particularly true for the variants, but then there's complicated effects if you have one variant sort of dominating and there's fewer people left that can be infected, then there's sort of this evolutionary pressure on the virus to mutate. 
and then you don't really know the probabilities of how the virus mutates. So it's the, the, the calibration is, is going to be impossible. The only thing we can do then is to assume reasonable scenarios and do a scenario analysis. Um, and I, I, I make a note of this because I agree it's interesting that we haven't, we haven't looked into this really. Okay, thank you. Um, Marco has a question too. Please, Marco, go ahead. Hi, yes. So, um, so I had a question um, uh, also on uh, other models, you know, similar models, whether there's any um, um, model that's similar to uh, an SIR, let's say, um, uh, differential equation based model uh, that includes endogenous behavior. And uh, the reason for asking this question is that I was curious, um, uh, basically, I mean, if I look at the uh, performance improvement of this model, how much of it comes from the presence of learning, how much of it comes from the fact that in ABM is going to be a lot richer, uh, you know, you have age heterogeneities, you, you have a lot of ingredients that you don't have in a very stylized SAR model. So, so is there, is there one element that's taking the bulk of the improvement and everything else is just refinement? And is this element the social learning or not? Awesome. Yeah, this is also a very good question. Um, we have done a normal SEIR model and have calibrated it as good as we can to Cape Town data. The calibration is slightly different though. That's why, and I haven't spoken about it in this presentation, but we had compared the ABM model with the normal SEIR model mainly actually to be sure that we can reproduce the SEIR model uh, with, because initially we were a bit un, unsure about can the ABM actually even produce this, right? Because there's lots of sources of just making errors. Um, there's lots of sources of uh, more endogenous behavior. So we did compare and we only give you the improvement of the endogenous learning over an ABM without endogenous learning because these models are the most directly comparable. Um, I, I can't give you the RMSE improvement over the normal SEIR model, but I think it's, it's going to be significant and more than the improvement over the endogenous learning brings over the other, um, the, 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 the normal agent-based model. But that's simply because the agent-based model um, is able to, uh, to predict better um, than the normal SEIR model, just because you have more parameters to play with. So it, it very no, it like naturally improves the fit. But I can't, like, we, we haven't really done that comparison, mainly because we, we couldn't get a normal SAR model with social learning. There's a few papers that start looking at this um, in the econ literature, but they very, very quickly depart and they, they then look at welfare or they look at macroeconomics and, you know, things that are beyond yes. what, what we care about for this particular kind of model. So there's no direct comparison, unfortunately, yet. It would be very interesting, um, and it's just a matter of time until a PhD student somewhere has a job market paper on an SEIR model with with that exact behavior. No, no, exactly. I mean, I asked because I was aware of macro, epi macro model, where you had the mm. whole macro economy embedded into it, but not simply, uh, you know, an epi model with endogenous yeah. behavior, like very simple stylized uh, model. So that's yeah, it'd be interesting. Of course. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Achimoglu, for example, they have a paper on, on like macro epi model. Yeah. But exactly. I, I, I'm not a big fan of those because all you do is you take a normal machinery that you have and you just attach a bunch of bells and whistles and you pander to the policymakers. And I don't think it adds a lot of knowledge easily, um, a, a lot of insights without wanting to sure. take anything away from these papers. But it's, yeah. you take two things that are not necessarily related just because you can put them together, it doesn't mean you, sh you should. So we, we've also tried to be a little disciplined in, in that, but yeah, the, the comparison yeah, yeah. would be nice. I, was, I wasn't talking about that kind of model. So uh, as I said, just uh, be curious to have just a simple epi model with endogenous behavior. But yeah, no, that's, thanks for that answer. Yeah. Cool, thanks. 